So in today's session, we are going to start a different type of footing. This could be the last type of manual design of footing, the design of a strap footing. So let me go with the problem statement first, and then I'll try to explain what is a strap footing and how to do that. So usually a strap footing is nothing but when you have two different columns or two different foundations close to each other. Suppose let's say you have two foundations close to each other or two footings close to each other, and you have the columns connecting to each one of them. Suppose let's say if the load that is coming on to either of the columns, suppose whatever the load that is coming onto this column and whatever the load that is coming onto this column is not appropriate. Suppose if you are unable to judge the loading conditions, that one that is one scenario. And the second scenario is if there is a chance that one of the foundations or one of the footings will try to settle than the other one when it happens. Suppose let's say you have a plot area. In the plot area, up to some extent, let's say up to here, you have a soil as a sandy soil. Okay, you have the soil as a sandy soil. Whereas here, this portion, you have the soil as red soil. Now, when you want to construct the foundations or when you want to lay the footings, since because only a smaller portion of the site area consists of sandy soil, you cannot go for the raft footing. It's not possible. Even if you go for raft footing, it's it's fine. There is no problem with that. But the problem is with respect to the economical aspects. So since economical aspects comes into picture, you cannot just for a smaller area. Let's say the total plot area is something like five square meters. Just some example, five square meters. And over, is, over a, an area of 0 0.5 square meters, you have this sandy soil. Now, in this 0 0.5 square meters area, you have to provide one footing attached with the column. Now, in that case, since only a smaller portion of area is having a sandy soil, just because of that, you cannot go for the raft footing or you cannot go for the deep foundations. So, in that case, what you have to do is you have to construct the column or you have to provide the footing. And then near to that, you have to provide one more footing. And what you have to do is you have to connect these two footings, whatever the footings that are available, you have to connect these two footings with a beam such that whatever the load that is coming onto this column will get transferred to this particular foundation. Similarly, whatever the load that is coming onto this co particular column or particular footing, that load will get transferred to this particular footing. So here what is happening? The load distribution will happen uniformly. Since load distribution will happen uniformly, there won't be any problem with the footing that is provided in the sandy soil portion. So that's the second way of providing the strap footing. And the beam, whichever we are providing, this particular beam is called as a strap beam. Some people will call it as a strip beam as well. So the beam which is provided or which is connected between two foundations or two footings, that beam is called as a strap beam or strip beam. So that's the second way. So usually the idea of providing the strap beam or strip beam is to maintain the load uniform distribution. Whatever the pressure that is upward soil pressure that is available, whatever the load that is coming onto the columns. So if you want to have uniform pressure distribution, especially when you have more than two or more than three different types of soil strata that are available in a single site. Suppose here I'm just taking only small area, five square meter, it's a very small area. Now assume that you are constructing a gated community. So when you are constructing a gated community, you are going to construct in a huge space. Okay, let's say some one acre of land or two acres of land. The carpet area of the building itself is one acre of land. Now in that case, throughout the one acre of land, you don't find the same soil everywhere throughout the area. So there is a chance that the soil strata will get changed based upon the location within the site area itself. So in that case, it is required to provide the strap footing. Okay, again, it depends on the requirement only. It's not every time it is used. So when you are using a strap beam or when you are going for the usage of the strap beam, it has to be very carefully decided where, where the strap beam positions are come. One thing that we need to remember is strap beams should never come at the central portion of the site. Okay, if you take the entire site area, suppose if this is your entire site area, strap beams 
should never come at the central portion of the site. Suppose if these are the two columns, you should not provide strap beams at the central portion of the site. Why? The reason is if you are providing the strap beams at the central portion of the site, uniform pressure distribution will not happen. The reason is whatever the columns that are available at the central part of the structure or the central part of the entire site area, those are the strong columns. I hope you remember a concept called strong columns, weak, weak beams, strong beams, weak column concept. So strong columns are always available at five different locations. The first location is at the coronets. Okay, these are the four locations where strong columns should be available. And also the central portion of the entire site area will also consist of the strong columns. Now, in that case, if you provide a beam, there is no use because the column is already strong. And if you are providing a connected beam, what it does is this beam will become a weaker section and this column will become a stronger section. And whatever the load that is coming onto the column, it can it can bear. There is no problem with it. But once the load get transferred to this beam, since the beam is a weak beam here or since the beam here will act as a weak beam, what will happen is that there is a chance that this beam will tend to break or this beam will tend to produce the crack formation. So that's the reason why we never provide 99.9% .9 of the times we should never provide the strap footings at the central portion of the site. Strap footings will come majorly at the end portions of the site or at the site edge portion. So maybe somewhere here or somewhere here. So edge portions of the site or boundary conditions of the site only the strap beams will come. Central portions should never come. That's one blind rule. This is what we are going to design. So what we are going to design here is we are going to design a combined footing. I hope we have already designed the combined footing, right? So we have designed one combined footing like this. So now we are going to design the same combined footing, but a beam is attached to these footings. That beam I'm going to call it as strap beam. Let us see how to do this one. So here, logically speaking, what type of footing that we are going to design is we are not going to design just a strap footing. We are going to design, you can say, combined strap footing. Okay, combined design of combined strap footing. That is what we are going to see. So the same problem statement we have seen earlier also. You can see here two columns having cross section 240 by 240 mm and 300 by 300 mm loaded with 300 kilonewtons and 500 kilonewtons respectively. And the center to center distance between the column is four meters, which is similar to the combined footing design. And the bearing capacity of the soil is 100 kilonewtons per square meter. And here you can see design combined footing with the strap beam. Okay, design combined footing with the strap beam being width of the foundation as two meters. So the width of the foundation is also limited to two meters. Same problem statement, but only one thing which is additionally coming is we have to design it using a strap tip. Okay, we have to design it using a strap tip. And the grade of the concrete is M20 and grade of steel is FE415 grade of steel. That's a problem statement. It's more or less similar to design of combined footing only, but we have to be very careful in designing the strap beam because that's the major part in this type of footings. If you don't design the strap beams for strong sections or for strong beam criteria, then there is no point in designing the strap footing itself. Right. So first let us uh, uh, consider the load calculations. So the first step you can see it as loads. So what are the loads that are acting on the section? So there are two loads that are coming onto the columns. One is 300 and the other one is 500 kilonewtons. So we can make it as loads coming from columns. Loads coming from columns equals to 300 plus 500 that equals to 800 kilonewtons. This is the total load that is coming from the column. And we know that self weight of the footing. Self weight of the footing. So which is taken as a 10% of column load. So 10% of 800 kilonewtons that equals to 80 kilonewtons. So therefore total load. The total load transferred to the soil transfer to the soil equals to you can make it as capital P that equals to 800 plus 80 that equals to 880 kilonewtons. This is the total load. Right? 
and now we need to find out the area of the footing so how to find out area of the footing we can say it as required area of a footing required area of footing so we can make it as area required equals to so how to find out the required area of the footing the total load divided by sbc of soil what is total load 880 kilonewtons divided by sbc of soil is 100 kilonewtons which is provided in the problem statement itself here you can see 100 kilonewtons per square meter so 880 upon 100 will give us 8.8 .8 square meters that's the area of footing right now from this area what we have to do is we know there is one condition that is given in the problem statement itself which is width of the foundation is limited to two meters that is also one thing that is given so width of the foundation width of the foundation or footing you can say which is represented with the bf that equals to two meters so since width of the foundation is limited to two meters we can easily find out the length of the footing but here the length of the footing is something critical how let us see let us see that suppose the problem statement what i am going to assume is i am going to assume it in this way suppose you have one column here uh, sorry you have a footing here let's say this is one footing and let us assume that here is one more footing okay this is one more footing now let us consider that there is one column which is available at the center of one footing i'll call this as column 2 okay i'll call this as column 2 and there is one more column which is available in this footing which is at the edge of the footing okay which is at the edge of the footing somewhere here it is there as per the design consideration it was given in this way so i'll call this as column 1 now what you have to do is you have to design a strap beam by connecting these two columns so this is how you should design so this is a strap beam so the pink the blue color one is the strap beam this is how you should design so this is how i'm going to make it okay usually the strap beams comes in this way only okay right so let us understand how to make it in this way so before that let us have some calculations here so the width of the footing is limited to two meters that is already provided in the statement itself and then you, we can call it as limiting width or just width limiting width let me call it as limiting width of the found footing let me call it as footing only instead of foundation limiting width of the footing equals to two meters now let us get the sum of length of footing sum of length of footing this is little different here than when you compare with the other ones so you can say it as l1 plus l2 that is length of footing one plus length of footing two that is what l1 and l2 represents length of footing one and length of footing two so that equals to total area of the footing is 8.8 .8. how many footings are there two footings are there so 8.8 .8 divided by 2 that gives us 4.4 meters okay 4.4 meters this is this is the sum of length of footing now how we have to design is okay how we have to design is we should design the footing in such a way that the center of gravity of the loads and the center of gravity of the column should coincide with each other okay the center of gravity of the loads and the center of gravity of the foundation or columns should coincide with each other why they should coincide you only if they coincide with each other then only there will be a uniform settlement okay then only there will be a uniform settlement so for that criteria we have to do this right so how to go with this one suppose uh, some just a second message has come uh, i think it's better if you can unmute and ask if there is something that is available let me check the message okay fine i hope it's clear now i um, mean the voice part right so now what we have what we are going to do is we are going to calculate the center of gravity of loads from any of the columns okay center of gravity of the loads from any of the columns so we have two columns 
So each column is carrying a different load. So let me show you that figure. Correct. So there are two columns that are available. This is column one and this is column two. Column one is carrying a load of 300 kilonewtons and column two is carrying a load of 500 kilonewtons. So we are going to assume at some distance X, the center of gravity is available. CG is center of gravity. So the total length is four meters. Where this four meters is coming from? It is the center to center distance between the two columns is already provided, which is four meters. So the center to center distance between two columns is four meters. And I'm assuming the center of gravity is lying somewhere between these two columns. Let us assume that that distance is X. OK, from the left portion of the column or from column one, the center of gravity lies at a distance X from the left edge of the column or from column one, you can say. So now let us calculate the values of X and Y. So how to calculate the values of X and Y? So we know the total load that is 300 kilonewtons. So 300 into the distance. What is the distance up to center of gravity from here? It is X meters. Okay, 300 into X, okay, 300 into X, that equals to the total load from column two is 500, okay, 500 into the total distance up to here. It is four minus X, okay, four minus X is the, this particular distance. Here I have represented it as Y, but forget about Y, we'll calculate later. So this distance will be four minus X, so four minus X. So if you solve this one, you're going to get the value of X. Okay, therefore, X equals to 2.5 meters. Now see, this distance is 2.5 meters. That is from left edge of the column. That is from column one to center of gravity. This distance is 2.5 meters. Now, what should be this distance? What is this distance? So the total distance is four meters, okay? Four minus, this distance is 2.5 meters, so that equals to 1.5 meters. Okay, 4 minus 2.5 is 1.5 meters. So this 1.5, I'm going to call it as Y. Okay, this 1.5, I'm going to call it as Y, right. So therefore, Y equals to 1.5 meters. Y equals to 4 minus 2.5 meters, that equals to 1.5 meters. Right. So that's how you can calculate the X and Y values. So in order to have uniform pressure distribution, the center of gravity from the left edge of the column or from column one should lie at a distance of 2.5 meters. And from right side, that is from column two, the center of gravity is lying at a distance of 1.5 meters. Right. So similarly, we have to calculate. This is a center of gravity of loads, you can say. Okay, CG of loads coming from column two. Okay, column two here is this one, 500 kilometers. The larger the load, the that is column two. Small loader column is column one, right? So now let us calculate the center of gravity of footings, okay? So CG of two footings, I was mentioning this, CG of two footings should coincide with the should coincide with the CG of loads. Why it should coincide? In order to have, in order to have the uniform pressure distribution. So in order to have the uniform pressure distribution, the CG of the two footings should coincide with the CG of the columns. Uh, so, sorry, CG of loads. So only then uniform pressure distribution will happen. So therefore, what we are going to do is, okay, therefore, equating, equating moments of superimposed, superimposed and reactive forces or reaction forces, you can say, reaction forces about center of, about center of column two. Okay, about center of column two. That is what we are going to do. So I'll show you one figure so that it will be having a clear idea. This figure we have to use. Right. So based on this particular figure, we are going to calculate the, or not calculate, we are going to equate the moments with respect to the reaction forces. 
okay so this is called l1 that is length of footing 1 and this is length of footing 2 okay l1 and l2 and i am going to make one column so this is you can call it as column 1 and this one as column 2 and this entire portion as footing 1 and this one as footing 2 so you have two columns provided in each of the footings and the center to center distance between the two columns is 4 meters lcc is nothing but length from center to center okay length of columns from center to center that is 4 meters and we have calculated the x distance which is 2.5 meters and y distance which is 1.5 meters so at this particular portion the center of gravity will be lying okay at a distance of x equals to 2.5 and y equals to 1.5 the center of gravity of the section will be lying so and the width of the footing is limited to 2 meters okay that is about this particular diagram right so now what we will do is we are going to equate the moments of superimposed and reaction forces from or about column 2. Why I am taking only about column 2? Because column 2 is carrying heavy loads. Okay, column 2 is carrying heavy loads. And also the center of gravity is close to column 2 only, not to column 1. That's the reason why we need to calculate with respect to column 2. You can also calculate with respect to column 1 as well. There won't be any problem. But it's better to go to calculate the values for the columns, whichever is carrying heavy loads, because you are designing it for the extreme conditions. Right. So therefore, y equals to there is a simple formula for this. So I'll call this as y capital Y capital Y equals to capital Y equals to a one that is area of a footing one. Okay, this is a fixed call. Uh, this is a fixed one, so you can use the same same formula for other calculations also. So a one into I think I have that one. Let me just have a check. Yeah, this is there. No problem. So I'll just get this one. So y equals to a one into l c c that is length from center to center into LP plus LP1, that is load from column 1, plus B1 by 2 minus L1 by 2 plus A2 into 0, that is X. So A1, X1 plus A2, X2 divided by total area, that is A1 plus A2, right? So I hope this formula is clear for you. So we, we have been doing this one based on center of gravity calculations, right? Simple engineering mechanics concept. So A1 is width of the footing into length of the footing 1, so A1 is area of footing 1. So BF into L1. LCC is nothing but center to center distance between two columns, which is 4 meters. And LP1 is 0. I'll tell you why I'm taking it as 0. I'll tell you some in some time. So B1 by 2. What is B1? B1 is width of column 1. What is width of the column 1? 240, I think. Yeah. 240 divided by 2 is 120. That is 0 0.12 minus L1. We don't know the value of length of the footing. That is L1 value we don't know. So 0 0.5. 1 by 2 is 0 0.5. So 0 0.5 into L1 plus A2 into 0. That is total distance. So if you solve this one, you are going to get the value of L1. So therefore, the value of L1 will become, so let me write that, L1 equals to, that is length of footing 1 equals to 2.177 meter. So based on this, if you calculate L2, you can also calculate L2. So L2 is L1 distance is 2.177 meters. We know this total distance. Okay, the center to center distance is 4 meters. And the length of this one is the, uh, L, L1 also we got, which is 2.177 meters. And if you do simple calculation, you're going to get the value of L2 as well. So L2 equals to Okay, L2 equals to 4.4. Okay, 4.4 minus 2.177, you can say. Or you can assume it in this way. So L1, I'm going to call it as, I'm going to take it as, instead of 2.177, I'll round it off to 2.2 meters. Okay, the length of putting one, I'm going to round it off to 2.2 meters. So therefore, L2 equals to 4.4 minus 2.2 meters. So that equals to 2.2 meters. So it's a square footing. 
it is square footing. So you can round it off to the nearest value also. Right. So that's how you can get the L1 and L2 values. Where this 4.4 is coming from, 4.4 is total area. Let me show you that. So if you we have already solved here, yeah, sum of length of footing, that is 4.4 meters. So that's how you are going to get the value of L1 and L2. So now we have decided length of footing 1 and length of footing 2 as well. Now based on this, we have to calculate the upward soil pressure. So how to calculate the upward soil pressure? So upward soil pressure. Upward soil pressure W equals to. So how to calculate this total load that is 800 divided by how many footings are there? Two footings are there. Okay, two footings are there. So two into okay, two into what is the area of length of each footing? 2.2 meters. What is the width of each footing? Sorry, L1 and L2. So L1 length of footing one is 2.2 meters. And the length of footing 2 is also 2.2 meters. So based on this, we are going to get the upward soil pressure as 90.91 kilonewtons per square meter. So that's how we can calculate the upward soil pressure. So similarly, we need to calculate the beam dimension, the strap beam dimension. So usually the width of the strap beam is provided as we need to look after the dimensions of the columns. Suppose let's assume it here in this way. You have two columns. OK, this is one column and this is another column. Let's say this is how the columns are. So this column is having a dimension of 240 by 240 mm. OK, 240 by 240 mm. And this column is having a dimension of 300 by 300 mm. So how will you provide the strap beam or width of the strap beam? So the width of the strap beam is decided based on the largest column dimension. Why? Suppose, let's say, if you are providing the strap beam with respect to the small column or the smaller dimension column, now the strap beam will come somewhere like this. Now, is it fitting to the column two? No, it's not fitting. So what you have to do is whenever when you have different dimensions of the columns, OK, when you have non-uniform dimensions, what you have to do is you always have to decide the width of a strap beam based on the larger dimension of the column. OK, so strap beam should be the width of the strap beam should be 300 mm. So this is how you should design the strap beam. OK. So now you may ask what we are going to do in this particular portion. This is all like additional portion only. So what we are going to do in this particular portion. So in this portion, what we will do is we'll fill it up with concrete. OK, we'll fill it up with concrete such that the width of a column two should match to the width of column one. So that's the reason why we need to always provide the width of the strap beam based on the larger dimensions of the column. Okay, based on the larger dimensions of the column, right? So let us uh, consider that one. So let me write that one. The width, or let's assume the width of strap beam as 300 mm. Why 300? Because 300 by 300 mm column is the largest one. Suppose if you have two columns in this way, let's say 300 by 300 mm is one column and 450 by 450 mm is another column. Now, in that case, what will be the width of the strap beam? You have to provide the larger dimension, which is 450 mm. Suppose if you have similar dimensions, let's say 300 by 300 mm, then you can provide the strap beam of width 300 mm because both columns are having uniform dimensions. OK, that's something with that we have to remember. Right. So the strap beam width is assumed as 300 mm. Now we need to calculate the projection of slab. Okay, we need to calculate the projection of slab. Let me write that. The projection of slab beyond the longitudinal phase of beam. Beyond the longitudinal phase of the beam. So how to calculate this one? We know the value that is the L1 and L2 values, which is 2.2 meters. 
okay we know l1 and l2 2.2 meters and width of the beam or width of the footing not beam width of the footing is 2 meters so the projection we are calculating so therefore it will become 2 minus the width of the column what is width of the column is it 0 0.3 or 0 0.24 remember as i was mentioning earlier we always have to consider the larger dimension column okay we should not consider the smaller dimension column so 2 minus 0 0.3 divided by 2 so if you solve this one you are going to get the value as 0 0.85 meters that's the projection of slab beyond the longitudinal face of the p okay 2 minus 2 is width of the footing 0 0.3 is the larger dimension of the column divided by 2 so this will be the projection of slab beyond the longitudinal phase of the beam so based on this we can calculate the moment also okay moment m equals to okay moment capital m equals to total upward soil pressure is 90.91 okay wl square by 2 formula 90.91 into l what is l the projection that is 0 0.85 square that is wl square up to here so wl square upon 2 wl square divided by 2 so if you solve this one you are going to get the moment value that is 32.84 kilo newtons meter from this we can calculate the ultimate moment that is mu equals to 1.5 times of 32.84 which will be 49.26 49.26 kilo newton meter so that's how we can calculate the ultimate moment now we need to calculate the depth of the beam okay how to calculate the depth of the beam it depends on grade of steel so depth of the footing not beam so depth of the footing so depth of the footing is based on is based on grade of steel so how to do that we know the formula mu limit that is limiting moment of resistance equals to for Fe415 grade of steel, it is 0.138 Fck B D square. That's the formula. So if you solve this equation, you know the MU value that is 49.26. Fck we know the grade of concrete, which is 20, and the B that is width. So here you can solve the value per meter dis. I mean, yeah, per meter distance you can calculate. You can consider it as one meter and then you can solve it and d value you can find it out so let me write those values so mu limit or ultimate moment of resistance 49.26 into 10 power 6 so i'm just converting in terms of newton mm equals to 0 0.138 into fck is 20 and b i'm just considering it as one meter distance so 1000 into d square so if you solve this equation you are going to get the value of d that equals to d equals to 133.559 mm so that's the d so you can get the overall depth of the section so let's assume the overall depth as somewhere like 400 450 500 any value you can assume okay so let us provide the overall depth of the section okay provide overall depth of the section sorry provide overall depth of the section as capital d capital d equals to 450 mm now here you might be confusing how i am deciding this 450 mm all these things in in all the problems whatever the models of problems that we have seen so far i'm just randomly getting some value there is i'm not giving any proper reason for why i am taking only 450 why i am taking only 500 600 something like that but obviously one thing is very clear which is whatever the original value that is there i am increasing much much but oh, much much more than the original value when it comes to the overall depth of the section on what basis i am doing that is all purely experience based okay since we are doing the manual calculation i am directly taking it as the highest one but in the software calculation we have to do trial and error method so we have we suppose let's say you don't know how to uh, how to take the overall depth of the section let's say that you got the effective depth as 133.49 and you adopted that as let me write it in this way 
So you got the over effective depth of the section as 133.59. So what you have done was you rounded it off to 140 mm. Let's assume it in this way. And in order to find out the overall depth of the section, how, how will you find out effective depth plus clear cover, which is 15 mm, plus diameter of bar divided by 2. Let's assume the diameter of bar as, let's say, some 16 mm, 12 mm, something like that. Let's say 12 mm by 2. So if you solve this one, what will be the value? 140 plus 50 is 190. 190 plus 6 is uh, 196. So let's assume that instead of 196 mm, you have assumed it as 200 mm. Now, if you solve it for 200 mm, I mean, since you are new beginner, you will obviously know that this 200 mm will not be sufficient. When you will get to know, when you are doing check for one way shear and check for two way shear, one in one case or in any of the cases or in both cases, you will not get tau v less than tau c. You will get tau v greater than tau c. So in any of the cases, be it in one way shear or in two way shear, if you are getting tau v greater than tau c, obviously you have to revise the depth. So what I am doing is, since I have done many calculations for this kind of problems and based upon the experience which I have, so I will be directly considering some larger value. And even if my assumption goes wrong, what I will do is I know how much I can increase. Suppose let's say I am increasing it overall depth as 450 mm. Now let's say that even the 450 mm, even at a depth of 450 mm also, let's assume that at one way shear, I am getting the value as tau v greater than tau c. Okay, when tau v is greater than tau c, obviously I have to modify the depth. Then what I'll do, I'll increase the depth to 550 mm, something like this, 550 or 600 mm. So maybe in this case, I will get the condition getting satisfied, which is tau v less than tau c. So it is all purely based on experience. Once you solve more and more problems or, uh, with respect to manual and with respect to software, you will understand these differences. Right. So that's how I'm going to calculate the overall depth of the section, which is 450 mm. So based on this, we can calculate the effective depth. Okay, effective depth available equals to overall depth of the section, that is 450 mm, minus clear cover, that is 50 mm, minus diameter of bar. So here I'm assuming the diameter of bar is 12 mm. You can assume 16, 14, anything. So I'm just changing it. So 12 divided by 2, so that equals to 394 mm. That's the effective depth. So this is the effective depth and this is the overall depth of the section. Now, based on this, we have to calculate the one-way shear and two-way shear calculations. So that, that is very simple. So there is no much complication here. So let me do that. Check for one-way shear. So check for one-way shear. All right. So in order to check for one-way shear, we need to calculate the shear force at a distance D from face of the column. Why distance D? Because critical section is available at a distance D. Okay. For one-way shear, for one-way shear. So I hope I don't want to write, I mean, I don't want to write that because you are all aware of that. So one-way, critical section for one-way shear lies at a distance D. Okay. So the shear force, I'll write it in this way, in the simplest form. The shear force at a distance D from face of beam. Okay, from face of beam, not from column, from beam, because we are providing the beam. So therefore, capital V equals to okay, capital V equals to upward soil pressure that is 90.91 into okay, into the section that is projection of the slab that is 0 0.85 meters. Okay. So the projection that is 0 0.8985 or 89. Let me check that. Yeah, 85 meters, 0 0.85 meters minus the effective depth that is 394 mm. So 0 0.85 minus 0 0.394 mm. So if you solve this particular one, you're going to get the shear force value that will be 41.45 kilonewton. See, like here the shear force calculations, couple of things are getting changed. It is all because of the effect of beam or effect of the strap beam, right? So this is the shear force value from face of the beam, not from face of the column, from face of the beam. This is again the very important one, right? So from this, we can calculate the ultimate shear force, which will be VU equals to 1.5 times of 41.45, which will be 
62.18 kilonewtons. So from this, we can calculate tau V and tau C. So tau V, I'll remake it as PV equals to 62.18 into 10 cube. 62.18 into 10 cube, right, divided by width of the foundation. I'm considering it as small b, that is 1000 mm, into the effective depth. What is effective depth? 394. Tau v equals to vu by bd formula. Nothing much I'm doing here. I'm just writing directly here. So if you solve this one, the value will become 0 0.1578 megapascals or newtons per mm square. So from this, we have to calculate the Tau, v, tau c value and check whether tau v is less than tau c or not. Okay, so let us check tau v is less than tau c or not. So, in before calculating tau c, how to do that? We need to calculate minimum percentage of steel. Okay, so pt equals to, so let me call the minimum percentage of steel pt equals to 0 0.12 percent. Okay, so if you solve this one, so I'm not going to solve this one, so I'll just leave it to you because we have already done many calculations. So I'll directly write the tau c value, which will be obtained as a 0 0.28 megapascals. So obviously tau v, see here you have to do the calculation. I'll let me write that so that you don't get confused where it come from. So I'll just make it as need to do own calculations. Check whether the same calculations are coming or not. Correct. So tau c value is coming. So tau v is less than tau c. So tau v is 0 0.15 and tau c is 0 0.28. So tau, since tau v is less than tau c, okay, since tau v is less than tau c, no shear reinforcement is required. No shear reinforcement is required in the slab. Sorry, in the slab. That is foundation slab, we can say. So let us calculate the area of steel, main reinforcement. So how to get the main reinforcement value? We know the formula, 0 0.5 into FCK by FY, this one. So let me get this formula. Right. So based on this formula, we have to calculate AST value. So we know FCK, that is 20 grade of concrete. FY is grade of steel, that is 415. MU value, we know. Uh, what is that MU value? Yeah, 49.26. And... FCK again is 20. B value, we are considering it as 1 meter length, that is 1 meter width, that is 1000. And D is effective depth, which will be 394. Yeah, 394 mm. So if you solve this one, you are going to get the value of AST. So that equals to 353.019 mm square. That's the total area that is required. So based on this, we can calculate the minimum area also AST minimum. So AST minimum equals to, we know the formula 0 0.12 percent B into D because B is 1000 and D is overall depth that will be 450 mm. So if you solve this equation, you will be getting the AST minimum as 540 mm square. How much we have to provide, I mean, how much we are getting 353. But what is the minimum that we have to provide? 540. So therefore, our area will become, or our area of steel will become 540 mm square. So let us assume the diameter of bar, something like 12 mm. So provide 12 mm dia bars with cover of 50 mm. Okay, with cover of 50 mm. So area of one bar of diameter 12 mm is so it will be pi by 4 into 12 square, so which will become 113 mm square. That's the area of one steel bar of diameter 12 mm. So pi by 4 into 12 square, if you do, you are going to get 113 mm square. So from this, you can get the spacing value also. So let us get the spacing. Spacing S equals to area of one bar, that is 113, divided by the total area, which is 540. Okay, 540 into the width that is 1000 so if you solve this one the area will the spacing will be 209 m so we can roughly adopt it as 200 mm center to center that's the space so we have to provide 12 mm diameter bars with a spacing of 200 mm center to center that's how we can calculate now the next thing is 
the calculation of shear forces and bending moments. That's that's the critical part here. Up to here, it's fine. There is no problem. So once we calculate the shear force and bending moment, we will get to know how to design a strap beam. Okay, we'll get to know how to design the strap beam and how to provide the reinforcement in the strap beam. Okay, we have to provide the reinforcement in the strap beam. We have to design the shear connections in the strap beam. There are many things that are coming up here. Right. So let us solve that. So for that, let me take the help of one diagram. This one, yeah. So understand this diagram carefully. Forget about the reinforcement part. Just understand this diagram. So I have footing one. So this you can see it as footing one. Yeah. So this is footing one and this is footing two. So you have the column, okay? One column here and the other column here, each column one and column two. So the width of the beam, we have decided it as 0 0.3 meters, okay? And the width of the footing is limited to two meters. And the length of footing one is 2.2 meters and length of footing two is also 2.2 meters. Up to here, it is fine. Now, from each column, okay, on each column, the loads are different. What are the loads? On column one, we have a load of 300 kilonewtons. You can see here. Okay, on column one, we have a load of 300 kilonewtons. And on column two, we have a load of 500 kilonewtons. And the center to center distance between two columns is 4 meters. That also we know, right? Right. So from this, we can calculate the values. Okay, how this 0.12 has come? It is the distance from center of the column. Okay, the distance from center of the column to the extreme edge of the footing, this particular distance. We know the total width of the column, which is 240 mm. So 240 divided by 2 is 120. So that's how this 120 has come. Okay, that is 0 0.12. Similarly, 1.10 meters also. Okay. So center, center of column two to the extreme edge of the footing, right? So we know the upward soil pressure that is 181.82 kilonewtons per square kilonewtons per meter. So I'm just converting into kilonewtons per meter. So usually the value is, what is the value of 90.91 something? That is upward soil pressure. Yeah, 90.91. So if you convert that into kilonewtons per meter, you're going to get 181.82 kilonewtons per meter. So I have already told you how to do the conversion of kilonewtons per square meter to kilonewtons per meter. So I'll not go into the details again. You can refer to the previous problem. I mean, combined footing design. Right. So now we have to calculate the shear forces. Okay, shear forces at different points. So as I was mentioning earlier, we need to calculate shear forces at left and right of each point. Okay, shear forces and bending moments we have to calculate at the left and right of each point. So let us do that. So here, instead of points, what I'll do is I'll just do it in a different way. Just for a, again, this is again a different step you can say. I mean, different way of calculating shear force. So shear force calculation along beam span. Right. So now shear force at a distance of zero meters. Okay, shear force at a distance of zero meters. So it will be shear force at A, B, you can make it as any way. So I'll just make it with reference to distances. Shear force at a distance of zero meters is zero. So here at this point, exactly at this point, what will be the shear force value? It will be zero. There is no load. Now, shear force at a distance of 0 0.12 meters. Okay, shear force at a distance of 0 0.12 meters. Let us write that. Shear force at a distance of 0 0.12 meters. That equals to what is the upward soil pressure? 181.82 into the distance. What is the distance? 0 0.12. Okay, 181.82 into 0 0.12. That will be the 21.82 kilonewtons. That's the shear force value. Okay. Similarly, shear force at a distance of 0 0.12 meters on the right side. So this is along the left side and this is along the right side, right? So that equals to 21.82, that is previous load or previous shear force value minus what is the load that is coming from column one, 300 kilometer. So 21.82 minus 300 
will give us the value of minus 278.18 kilohertz. It's a negative value. Right. Similarly, shear force at a distance of 2.2 meters. Okay, shear force at a distance of 2.2 meters. So let us calculate that. So shear force at distance of 2.2 meters. So that equals to along the left side. So the total load is uh, the total shear force value is 278.18 plus the upward soil pressure at 181.82 into the distance what is the distance it will become uh, 4 minus yeah 4 minus 0 0.12 it will become 2.08 so that will be 2.08 that equals to 100 kilometers that's a value similarly shear force at the right side of 2.2 meters this is left side and the previous one is left side and this one is right side so the total value is 100 kilonewtons previous one plus upward soil pressure that is 181.82 into the distance what is the distance 1.1 meters okay 1.1 meters so that equals to 300 kilonewtons all right similarly shear force at a distance of what is the other distance 4.2 meters oh, sorry 4.12 4 plus 0 0.12 so shear force at a distance of 4.12 meters that equals to the previous value is 300 minus what is the load from column one column two 500 kilometers so 300 minus 500 that equals to minus 200 kilonewtons minus 200 kilonewtons similarly at the distance of 0 0.12 plus 4 plus 1.1 that will be 5.22 so shear force at 5.22 meters equals to the previous load is 200 plus the upward soil pressure it is 181.82 into the distance what is the distance distance is 1.1 meters so into 1.1 so if you solve this one obviously zero only so, but i'm just showing you it is zero kilometers of load right so that's how we can calculate the shear force value similarly we have to calculate the bending moment values also so yeah i'll just make this bending moment I'll do one thing. I'll just write directly the values. So if you get any doubts, well, I mean, I, you try to solve the bending moment values. Okay, bending moment calculation along beam span. Okay, so I'll just write directly the values because I have already the values I have calculated before the start of this session. So I'll just directly write the values. You cross check when you are solve. I mean, you try to do it with the proper formula and you cross check it and Check whether the values, whether my values and your values are matching or not, so that it will be a uh, like mutual work. So bending moment at zero is obviously at the ends is zero kilonewtons meter, and similarly bending moment at zero point one two meters. So if you don't get the same values, let me know in tomorrow's session. However, I'll solve. Okay, if you don't, if you are not getting, so bending moment at a distance of zero point one two meters is one point three one kilonewtons meter. And bending moment at a distance of 1.65 meters. So you can consider this as an assignment, kind of. Just to refresh your basics of shear force bending moment calculation, nothing much here. Right. And then bending moment at a distance of 2.2 meters, which will be minus 183.99 kilonewtons meter. And bending moment at a distance of yeah, 4.12 meters. Bending moment at 4.12 meters that equals to 110 kilonewton meter. And the last one is bending moment at 5. Point, yeah, 5.22 meters. Bending moment at 5.22 meters that equals to 0 kilonewton meter. So these are the bending moment values at different portions. Okay. So you try to have a cross check with these values and let me know whether my values are matching with your values or not so that it will be even I'll also be clear to whether I have done it right or not. Right. So from based on these values, we have to draw the shear force and bending moment diagrams. 
So I have already drawn the shear force and bending moment diagram. I'll directly show you the diagram. Yeah, this is the one. So you can see the shear force and bending moment diagrams at each and every sections. So this is the shear force diagram and this is the bending moment diagram. So you can have a cross check later. So in the next session, what we will do is I'll tell you how to design the strap beam. Okay, because strap beam design, we have many things that need to be considered. So we need to design the strap beam. So basically, we have to de decide the depth of the strap beam. That is minimum depth, overall depth, that things. And then we have to design the longitudinal reinforcement in the strap beam, the main reinforcement uh, in the column two, and then column one reinforcement. All these things we have. So I'll, I'll talk about those reinforcement design calculations in the next session. So with next session, uh, most probably we will complete the manual design of footings. So probably from day after tomorrow session, I'll be starting the software calculation. So please have your software readily installed so that uh, when I'm doing, after my class gets complete, if you want to practice, it would be better if you have the software also. Probably by day after tomorrow, most probably by day after tomorrow, we'll start the software I mean software design. But again, the very first class will not be mostly included with the software. It will be like, I have to explain what are the things that need to be considered. Explain a couple of terminology. Anyways, we'll see that then in the day after tomorrow's session. So tomorrow's session will be focused on the design of strap beam and the design of reinforcements in the two footings, that is combined footing with a strap beam. Right. So that's from my end for this particular session. If you have any doubts, you can unmute and ask the doubt. Thank you.